Hi. Hello. Hi. Hey, Thomas. I'm uh, I'm in Auckland, New Zealand, actually, right now. Oh, okay. All yeah. right. <laughs> I'm sure if you would have stayed in LA, it'll probably be like uh, pouring as well. Um, and we're in yeah. February now, and everyone in January kept talking about a dry January. Did you jump on that wagon? <laughs> Just for about two weeks, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> It was, a, it was a damp jan i didn't do it just because like our weather in here in california wasn't being dry so it's like you know what january is telling me to have a wet january so i'm just gonna enjoy <laughs> drinking good for you yeah good and you. by the way if you haven't tried now i'm just super plugging uh post malone the rapper he has his own rose it's called masson number nine it's okay really great it's good <laughs> all right i'll try that amazing thank so, you for the recommendation this is my first interview in my new apartment and i want to ask you do you remember the time when you moved out of your family's place on your own and this could be you know the move from new zealand to los angeles um i do actually it, yeah i so I moved out of home when I was 18, um, actually maybe 17, and uh, lived in the city here in Auckland for a little while, um, just working at a record store. This is like early days of the Naked and Famous, um, Elisa and I, we, we started university and then we dropped out of university because we just had too many bills. So we were just working for a few years, starting the band, participating in the local indie scene. And then we moved back to my parents' house um, for a couple, almost two years I want to say it was like a year and a half um so I had like one leaving home then one returning home and then everything sort of blew up the band and then we left so uh my yeah I, I don't know I had sort of a, a double double leaving um and the second time I left was just to begin touring so it wasn't like I didn't have an apartment or anything it was like leaving to go on the road and just endlessly for two years really yeah and just sleeping on the tour bus or the tour van i'm i'm embarrassed to yeah. say at what age i finally left my family's place but if i were to go back i'd probably start crying <laughs> uh, yeah well i i um i would make a big effort to come back once a year um and touring used to provide that for um it was, it was very easy to come back so let's talk about your your lp you know it addresses your personal journey to adulting which i think we're we're both going through right now um when it comes to relationships not with just a partner but personal um you discuss about empathy anxiety restlessness how the mun mundane things become just a routine and we realize how life gets more complicated and surreal as an adult and what i've been noticing with myself um time management and scheduling for me has been like i need a planner because even when i was trying to coordinate this interview i was like wait it can't be on tax day wait i gotta do my chores i'm hanging out with friends so that to me has been the most troublesome as being as an adult but what about you do you find balancing work life and maybe your romance could have some challenges as an adult yeah i, f I find it to be um more balancing life in general um i think that i don't have any trouble now balancing my work with my relationships or friendships you know that that part is very clear to me even if i don't do a good job of it um i'd say it's easier now because i have a more established life as an adult where i think when i was younger i was uh basically living my music dreams with my band and that was all consuming and that just was my life and i think especially in my music that talks about and sings you know i'm singing a lot the, ly the lyrical content is about sort of stepping away from that and growing up so not just being a guy in a band anymore you know like th that was my oh, i feel like that was my entire personality um, and now I feel more like a person outside of the band and like, I have a life that exists and it doesn't like, I don't describe myself as just a person in a group who plays guitar and sings. <laughs> I have interests. I have things I like to do. I have a home, I have a partner. I, ha I have all these things that, that are more important to me now. Um, and I think surprise is another thing that I dealt with in, in the lyrics, like being surprised at how important those 
things are to me now and more important than being just like the band guy um so yeah it's about shift shifting priorities i think that's a lot of what the album deals with do you think you've become a better person than you were in the earlier days because i'm listening and i got to listen to the entire lp but when i'm listening to the tracks like filth and, and preston and they kind of come off like an all ap apologetic lullaby and so i'm wondering if this is like you looking at yourself like in a mirror thank you that's i'm glad you got to hear the whole thing and that's i i like that you heard, highlighted those two specifically because i'm not promoting them as singles but those songs in particular are very important to me and i feel um very proud of them and i, I want to highlight them but you know i think when you're looking at promoting music you tend to go to something that might be higher energy more engaging more immediate and these very very slow really emo <laughs> confessional songs are probably the ones that mean the most to me you know um but yeah the, the, lots of it is very confessional um and uh, like you said apologetic and that is more to do with i think the adult realizations of having one-on-one -on -one relationships um and that's just that's just general self-reflectiveness that i think I, I again i pour into the music a lot this it's quite it is quite self-deprecating but i'm trying not to be um i don't want to be too uh cheesy and self-deprecating like i find uh and, and i mean self-deprecating that it like the confessional nature of it is very like it's like damning you know I'm, I'm sort of wearing my heart on my sleeve and but i i think that a lot of the music i grew up listening to especially in like the late 90s i was a massive nine inch nails fan the kind of self-deprecating quality of the music then is it's very over the top it's it's like not self-deprecating it's self-loathing you know it's like it's very um extremely dark and there's almost like a suicidal ideation component to it so i, I i'm careful not to go that far in my music because that's to me i feel that's now almost seems quite immature um but yeah there there is a lot of i would say that the the romantic elements of the music tend to be more grounded and about the work that goes into love. Yeah, because it's not easy. Um, and I'm, I'm yeah. glad uh, to know that you're a Nine Inch Nails fan. And let's talk about the title of your LP, A Tyrant Crying in Private, and which is also a lyric from your song Lie with Chelsea Jade. And when I think of the title, I'm thinking about historical tyrants like Henry the Eighth, he's crying because none of his wives gave him a son, or um, <laughs> Hitler losing yeah. World War Two, and and Trump being defeated in the election. But where did that title yeah. come from? Um, yeah, great. That's exactly who I'm comparing myself to. <laughs> All those people. Um, yeah, I, I think it was just. I tell you what, that specific lyric it was the lyric that Chelsea jumped on and really liked. I had it written down and I knew that it was just a clever little phrase that I could put in the song lie and it connected to it and I needed help finishing it off. I'd gotten about like two courses, two courses in on lie and then I hadn't finished the song and I went to Chelsea Jade, fellow Kiwi artist who I've known for a very long time. She lives in America too now. And I said, hey, do you want to jump on this song? And she was, she loved it. And on the day, that was the only lyric I had and I, we I think we had verse two was empty or maybe only a fraction of it was done so we finished that together and then the bridge I showed her this lyric and she just loved it and immediately began singing it and that became the bridge section um and that song in particular like was the it was the real eureka moment for me where I recognized that I'd made a strong and confident solo artist sound and that was that was going to be the, the center of it um, and I don't know, I think it was just a lyric that stood out. I think it, I think often it's obvious when you find the lyric that stands out, that seems to summarize everything. It's just, it just tells you that that's going to be the title. And so, yeah, I, uh, I thought about it for a little while and then rolled with that as the title. It just seemed to summarize everything. It was, you know, dramatic, but funny and had a nice ring to it. Felt like a little wordplay-ish. Um, yeah, I'm really proud of it. I think I'm I'm most proud of the lyrics and the titles on this album. Probably more proud than I have been of anything. 
if I have any titling or, or lyrics. Um, I feel like I put a lot of thought into them. So yeah, thanks for highlighting that. Yeah, it's a great song. And also the other song you did with her, The Big Feel, is another good one. And when it yeah. comes to collaborations, because you also had a Grammy winner, Julian Baker, on it, and the Now Now. So when you're crafting these songs, how do you envision, like, okay, here's this particular artist I want to feature and how they get involved with the process? Um, yeah, I mean, I wish I could say that it was that intentional, you know, I, I, because... I would love to operate that way and, and be, yeah, like have someone in mind, but really, you know, beggars can't be choosers. So I just work with whoever's keen <laughs> to work on the song. But, but um, it, I'd say if, if any songs that, if any songs I have do feel like they were very strategically crafted to make space for the other person, I think that's just a skill that I picked up. Or I, li I like to imagine I picked up from years of work with the Naked and Famous because Elisa and I uh, have distinct voices, separate ranges. Um, you know, we sing differently. We, we, we have two unique voices. And I've just, at this point, I feel like I've had so much experience um, with the idea of a duet that I have a lot of tricks and production techniques and songwriting techniques. I'd say they're more production techniques than songwriting to craft something that sounds like a balanced song it's balancing both singers um and i feel like i'm I'm quietly quite critical of other artists when they will put out duets because they'll do things like sing in unison and i and i can hear a missed opportunity for a harmony um or you know like i like to make things so that they're either turn based you know you take a turn i take a turn call and response or you take a full verse i take a full verse we sing in harmony here and then we sing in unison here and everything's very intentional so i think just years of working like that and trying to give each singer a space uh, meant that working with all of the collaborators, no matter how we're working, like whether it was remotely or in the studio, I had all these plans and ways to give everyone their minute. Yeah. So that they could be heard. Yeah. And I mean, that shaped you as a well-rounded musician and also um, with this project, you were very hands-on with the writing, producing, uh, mixing, and engineering, and the creation became so sonically eloquent, and it's thought-provoking, and it's dreamy, and it's cinematic, and I understand that you took a love for film scoring. I was wondering if there has been a specific film score that really captivated this project that you wanted to make it your own. Yeah, I mean, thank you. I, I appreciate that you can hear that. I, yeah. I would say that I've always had just a, a big love of film and it was as equally as important an escape to me as a young person as music. Um, I'm a complete novice when it comes to film. Like it's just still, it's still something that just genuinely excites me. Music, because it's something I see behind the curtain often. I, I'm not as excited by it as easily. Whereas I'll watch an okay film. <laughs> I won't listen to an okay song, you know, or I'm, I'm less forgiving or picky. It's, yeah, it's still something that deeply inspires me and gives me motivation. And, and yeah, it's, it's a joy still rather than something that's also a work. But um, so generally speaking, film score has been, has left a lasting impression on me. And there have been all kinds of scores that have ended up having an, a deep influence on songwriting specifically um even little moments from surprising things like moments in the fifth element <laughs> made it but you know had an influence on specific naked and famous tracks <laughs> so now in my solo music um the way that the way that it's it's made its way in is that a lot of the pieces almost begin as as score they're so moody and they don't have a song structure and I'm not thinking about how to sing on them. Um, and then the singing part will come afterwards. Or if you remove the, the vocal, they work perfectly as an instrumental song. So for me, it was about exploring composing um, and then marrying that with all this experience I have with um, Indian alternative. And there are some people that have been a pretty large influence in direct somebody i've tried to well i'm looking up to um one of them is it's a guy called bobby krillick 
who is the Hacks and Cloak. And he's done a bunch of um, scores and, but also is an artist. And his art, his artist project is maybe quite different to some of the score, but just there's a, there's a connectivity there. Um, seeing Tom York do the Suspiria soundtrack, that was really like motivating. Um, and then Trent Reznor's journey from Nine Inch Nails to like almost exclusively a composer now um, that had a huge influence. Um, Oliver Arnold's an artist I really, really enjoy. His music has always lent itself to score. He's in the post-classical genre. You know, his, uh, much of his music is neoclassical or post-classical. He's done lots of scoring. Um, I adore his music. And then Max Richter, I loved when I was younger as well. Again, like towing the line between post-classical little moments of post-rock almost in Max Richter's music and then his uh his music has been just been used for score almost in its pure album form like um there's uh, one song oh gosh I always forget the title it's either Infra or um oh it has a different name but it's it's off one of his records um it was used in Arrival and it's like this the, the film Arrival uh, in 2016 and there's this moment at the end of the movie where it's just the Max Richter track. He didn't do the rest of the score. I think the rest of the score was Johan Johansson. And Max Richter got this like one moment in this movie, but it is just the song taken from his album rather than written for the movie. So I, find, I found that especially inspiring. Um, and I started listening to this, like Max Richter, I remember I started listening to him and being really motiv motivated by his music when I was like, yeah, 17, 18, pretty young. And it was so far away from what I was going to do, like indie alternative guitar based stuff. And I always I held on to this like dream of one day I'll be able to make music like that. One day I'll be able to play the piano just well enough to make music like that. Um, so yeah, now I'm finally seeing it through. Yeah, yeah, but, exactly. But I'm still not fully committed to it. It's not like I'm fully going down that path because a lot of someone like Max Richter is strictly just classical music. No, he's not a vocalist or anything. I'm. I don't think I'll ever fully commit to that. I think I'll always take a path more like Trent Reznor, you know, where it's always incorporating uh, ambient rock elements. It's soundscapey stuff. Like I'm not, I'll never be a good enough classical musician to <laughs> just, just be doing that. Set your mind to it. And speaking of Tom York, I went to a Vincent Van Gogh art gallery and he oh, wow. ended up scoring the whole entire music of that exhibit it's like very ambient and then all of a sudden it shows the credits and it says music by tom york oh no like no way oh, that's amazing the instrumental tracks as well and also i heard some distortion like i think the end of preston it just like ends with that it's like what the suspense yeah. but um is Thank that you. something you wanted to convey with like emotion and then trying to like lure the listener like okay what's gonna happen next I feel like with my own music, I just get to do whatever I want, you know, like I definitely play it to people and get a lot of feedback and try and be as open to critical, you know, ideas with people react like badly to it. I, it, it makes me think <laughs> about what I've done, but yeah, like distorting the whole song, like I, I get to do that in this. So it's, it's some things like that. I don't care. I'm just like, I love this. I'm, I'm committing to it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just committing to it. I know I know that like what I think what happens when you like produce and mix and you're creating and recording music all the time is that you get bored of a lot of standardized ways of producing and presenting music and you want to try interesting things, but often that that to the average listener can be quite jarring. So I try I try not to go too far out into that space, but I know that certain things that I find exciting like maybe general listeners find quite abstract or bizarre or are uncomfortable or they're not as excited by them because they're not sitting there all day recording stuff so i like to distort things a lot okay yeah because <laughs> i was sound broken and i'm like wait is there something wrong with my speaker <laughs> yeah exactly so that's the <laughs> okay so that's the concern that there there is exactly the problem which for me i think it's exciting for me i'm doing something that feels clever but mm -hmm. depending on how much context you have for that th there is a worry that some people will will think oh that's wrong or that sounds broken or that sounds odd um so it's a gamble it's definitely a gamble and the, i think the toss up there is you know, you might be able to reach more people if you go for a safer sonic approach. 
but are you interested in reaching people that are actually excited by the challenging science approach? Or does it does none of that matter at all? You just like it to so do what is exciting to you. Yeah, I had to listen to it these times. Up. And then I realized like, oh, it's purposeful. And it actually does convey with the message of the song. And, you know, you're a producer. You, you talk about composing. Not only do you work on your own music, you've also worked on with other artists, including Meg Myers. You co-produced her last album, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. And Thank I you. love hiding that I'm sexual. It is such a banger. <laughs> I would run to that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was a really cool song to be involved with. And. It was very organic because I just started working with Meg, helping her produce the rest of her album. She had songs that were half finished and she wasn't quite sure uh, whether the production was in the right space. So she just took a gamble on me and asked me to come in and take them a little bit further into just a different production space. And so I already had all these, you know, um, sort of half written or fully written or, you know, lightly produced or intensely produced demos that I was basically like diving into but that song in particular was like a song that I had like an instrumental track that I had written over COVID and it was just sitting there and Naked Famous weren't doing anything so I sent it to Meg one night and I was like hey Meg I'd like just throwing this your way see if you like it I don't know if you want to try to sing over it and like two hours later or something like that she had just gone super hyped and sent me back this vocal on on the track and she's like I love it here's the here's on the top line and it was it was pretty much done you actually written the verse and then chorus one i think um and then she was like i love this let's finish it i'll come around and we'll we'll track the rest of it and write the rest of it together and um i was like amazing super stoked but she was like the song title was i'm hiding that i'm sexual and that was the lyric and i was like maybe we should have another woman writer in the room because like i don't know if i don't know if you just want like the only other writer to be me it just felt like a little inappropriate i was like i really want to finish this with for you but like i'd worry about not being able to get your message just you know makes a woman and i was just sensitive to you know trying to like slot myself into that writing session so um and she she thought that was hilarious she was like laughing at me like yeah great great idea let's let's get other woman in to help um finish the the top line um and then luna shadows came in i work with her all the time she helps me with my solo stuff she she's had a lot to do with like creative directing my solo uh, career. Uh, she's had a lot of input on things like artwork and she helped direct these still life series of, of videos and she's she's written a bit um, and yeah she's she's all amongst the credits. Um, she's probably my one go-to person for everything uh, in my solo stuff um, and she jumped in on the track and and then Meg loved having her so much that she wanted to feature her and it, the whole thing was like really fun super organic experience. Yeah and, and a lot of very laughs. empowering and does that attract you to work with other artists and their music is very different from yours. Yeah, I love that actually. And it's probably something that I'd like to work on. I think this year, um, trying to branch out more from what I, I feel like I've had a hard time. I get kind of pigeonholed as naked and famous producer guy. So, you know, big, loud, bombastic sounds. Like I think people just presume that the sound of something like young blood or just any of that the high point of the naked famous like that is the sound that i can do and and i can do that and i am i do feel confident doing that that's what i'm that's what my, my training has gone into you know like that's my skill but then i've also worked on lots of different subgenres of indie and alternative and rock music that i and now i really want to do I'd like to do like a country record or, you know, just something really different. <clears throat> I think a very organic album is something that I'd love to love to work on, you know, um, just a very folk indie organic record. That is something I'd love to, somebody else's album. I'd love to just be the producer for that. And then the other dream I have, I think is producing a really heavy rock band, like much heavier than the Naked and Famous ever was just, like something like turnstile you know like a hardcore group or i'd love to just be the kind of producer mixer for a group like not the writer or anything just somebody who could be there and work in the studio and i'd love to just flex that skill and not worry about the writing but sort of weigh in in this high level way and help record so two things like that. that 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 would be my dream um or a friend who's done a lot of work on my album called rob moose and he's a strings arranger he's kind of a rock star violin player 
Um, he's just worked for everyone. It's insane. He's worked for Taylor Swift and Bonnie Bear and St. Vincent and just like name a pop record and he's probably got a, a string moment on it. It's, it's wild. Um, and Rob did this EP where he had all, all the people, these guest vocalists that he knows. He's got all these connections to these people. And they um, like gifted him some sort of B-sides or, or songs that never really got finished or, or made it to albums. And he went and reimagined them as string arrangements. And so it's like his solo album, but it's like his guest vocalist singing over his music. Like mixing an album like that would be really cool. Just something fu- like way out left from rock. But yeah, that's something I want to work on this year. I loved his string arrangements on your LP. And you know what? I, I totally see that in the future. I could pick up like a CD or something and then it'll say Thomas Powers, like, you know, producer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. This is the <laughs> only question I will ask about the Naked and Famous. I saw you guys sure. years ago at the Fox Theater in Oakland. And I noticed like almost every song you had to have a new guitar. And I was like, oh my gosh, how many guitars does he have? But... Uh- <laughs> <laughs> Out of those guitars, I don't know if you still have them, but what's the longest like, you know, of the guitar you've had and what songs were burped out of them? Oh, good good question. Um there there are two guitars that I have and they're like Fender Telecasters. They used to do this guitar. I think they still do it. It's called a 72 Deluxe. And it's the first nice high quality guitar that I bought when the Naked and Famous was like a young group in New Zealand before we had any international attention or success I bought that guitar and I had to save up and I think it was like the record label that we signed to at the time the little indie label that was like one of the expenses was like a new guitar for me and I was just like over the moon and I love it so much it has a very specific shape and feel to it it's a bigger larger guitar with a quite a flat fretboard for people like me who have bass player fingers like big chunky fingers so I could actually play it it's not like a little, little nick um and so this is all very microscopic details but but for all these reasons that guitar has always been a specific favorite of mine and now having had the guitar for this long played it for so many albums and like just kind of stuck with it for years i think it is like that's my guitar like i have a guitar a single one that will always be my thing and i don't know if i'll ever need to get all that that many more guitars <laughs> i basically have only fenders now but i've li- i've given i've let go of a few and I, I try not to have like a massive collection i try to have just the ones i really love and really need i tried to marie condo my musical instruments a little bit my my e- e- ethic for the studio is to have everything i need and nothing i don't did you give one of those guitars to the guy you traded handles at thomas powers I totally did. Yeah, <laughs> I did. I did. I thought it was a cool swap. <laughs> That's what I need on my wall is a Thomas Powers guitar. I'm like already trying to decorate with posters in my new apartment. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Okay, yeah, so... I'll, uh, I'll find something. I'll find something to trade you. Okay, perfect. Um, And like you said, you used to work at a record store. If I was going to walk into that record store, what record would you introduce me to? Oh, what album would I introduce you if you walked into Real Groovy Records? Mm-hmm. I think I would, well, I'd probably interview you first. I'd say, like, tell me some of the things you <laughs> like. You know, like, I would I would do a proper job. I think that's the thing that I picked up from working in the record store is that people would actually come in and ask for, and that was actually a skill, I remember, now that I'm remembering it. Someone would come in, and it was really sweet when it was older people as well. Like, you know, someone's grandma had come in and they were looking for music. So the... You had to really hone this skill of being able to figure out what they liked, what they were interested in, take them to the section of the store. And then, God, this is such a lost art now. But yeah, like little lovely little old lady comes and she wants, she's heard some song or something and she didn't know what it was. And you, you had to go and like find all these things. And maybe it was a Michael Bublé song. And then you're like, oh, if you like this, I'm going to put this on for you. And you'd stack up a bunch of albums for the person, the customer that you're trying to help and show them some stuff and like highlight a few tracks. And you'd be like, check this one out and have a listen to this and jump to that one. And it was such a satisfying and thrilling experience to, to be knowledgeable enough, even in genres that you maybe despised, you know, <laughs> but you could, you could show someone something they really loved and give them a bunch of recommendations. Then if you were good at that, working in the record store, people would come back in or you'd get recommended and then you'd get like a staff's pick lane, you know, where people would come in and they'd know what Tom 
was into and oh i like his music i'm gonna always check out his staff pick um i think i got a staff pick for a little while after working there for several years but but yeah um that's so kind of like your employee answer. of the month. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So the Grammys just happened. If you could come up with a new category, what would it be? For the Grammys? Um, I think that I would come up with a category that was voted by um, specific memberships. So in New Zealand, we have something called the Silver Scroll. And if you are in... Um, an APRA member, which is the publishing rights for songwriters for 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 um, publishing, not the master rights for recording, but it's, it's for published. So anyone who's a songwriter who's earning any money or whose who songs are publicly released, you have an APRA membership and a number and an ID, and that's where you track all your royalties through. Um, and so each year for the Silver Scrolls, APRA members vote on the best song of the year. And the Naked and Famous were lucky enough to win one for Youngblood, you know, a decade ago. And that's voted by your peers. So that's every songwriter gets to vote. And so you, when you win that award, you know that all the people who are, you know, competing for space as musicians, as artists, have voted for you. It's not some sort of board of people who are not musicians. It is other musicians and other writers, strictly that have voted for that. And you got the majority vote from this pool of people. And in that pool of people is New Zealand. That's all New Zealand writers and songwriters and music musicians and artists. And um, so, and I think the, the Grammys did not have that. And I think it would be a very different um, experience if there were ways of knowing that this was voted by your peers, this was voted by the public. So I think I would, I would create categories that were very strictly and obviously voted by yeah, rather than some ambiguous, you know, boardroom of people that you you don't know. You yeah, know? I think it could be like industry vote, fan vote, and and I think I think other artists voting would be really cool because there's yeah there's something very special about being recognized by your peers. That yeah, feels like a very very high honor. It's different to having a fan of your music because that's really kind of what you do it for is just general love of music. But there is a, there's a really nice feeling about another musician recognizing that you've done something good. In so, San Francisco, we have self-driving cars now that they just drive on its own. Would you ever go in one of those? Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't trust people. I don't trust machines. I'm holding people. Yeah. Yeah. I work at a news station. So if you could come up with a news headline, what would it be? Album of the year, Thomas Powers, a tyrant crying in private. <laughs> will we hear that live? Or is there going to be a tour coming? I love to play live. It is the, it's on my mind. I feel like it's an urgent and pressing thing for me to get onto. I actually feel very comfortable with planning live shows. Um, I'm still building a fan base and an identity. I do, I do not have the the numbers to to know that I could put on a show yet, but I would really really love to. And it is something I know that I can do to promote my music. I'm very comfortable performing and sitting up live shows. It's, it's for some people they get a lot. It's, it's like stage fright. It can be very nerve wracking, and there are nerves involved. But for me, it's actually one of the things that I feel I have the most control over. I know how to do live music. So I'm, but I'm also this is quite a studio project. So I'm kind of torn between wanting to just make three albums in three years or put effort into trying to set up live shows and trying to get gigs and trying to get support slots and so yes i'm not sure i hope so <laughs> just do the taylor swift thing she just comes out of a new album every year <laughs> exactly yeah that's what I mean. <laughs> well i hope you make it to the bay area again and your music isn't just background music because i was reading your tweets if you still call them that but you're like oh yeah. you know have a cup of coffee while listening to this lp or do your laundry while listening <laughs> yeah yeah, I want people to focus. It's it's not it's not music that you really can put on in the background. It would um I think it would be I mean every everybody says that, but I think like you said, there's these distorted moments that will make you think that your stereo right, is all of a sudden like, wait, what the <laughs> Yeah, your your AirPods are crapping out. <laughs> okay. Thomas Power, thank you so much for your time. Great, all I right. appreciate that. Sorry. All right, and your parents have a beautiful home. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much. My mom's going to be stoked to hear that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Bye. Love you. Talk to you. Bye.